a rendition. Supreme Court of the United States. Number 19-1392. Thomas E. Dobbs, State Health Officer of the Mississippi Department of Health. Et al. Petitioners. V. Jackson Women's Health Organization. Et al. June 24th, 2022. Justice Kagan, joined by Justice Breyer and Justice Sotomayor. In this case, the state of Mississippi filed an action to uphold a statewide ban on abortion after 15 weeks, despite the 50-year-old decision in Roe v. Wade that granted a constitutional right to abortion. After it filed, the state of Mississippi went further, urged the overturning of the constitutional right to abortion altogether. The majority of the court agrees. We do not agree. We dissent. For half a century, Roe v. Wade in 1973 and Planned Parenthood of Southeastern Pennsylvania v. Casey in 1992 have protected the liberty and equality of women. Roe held and Casey reaffirmed that the Constitution safeguards a woman's right to decide for herself whether to bear a child. Roe held and Casey reaffirmed that in the first stages of pregnancy, the government could not make that choice for women. The government could not control a woman's body or the course of a woman's life. It could not determine what the woman's future would be. Respecting a woman as an autonomous being and granting her full equality meant giving her substantial choice over this most personal and most consequential of all life decisions. Roe and Casey well understood the difficulty and divisiveness of the abortion issue. The court knew that Americans hold profoundly different views about the morality of terminating a pregnancy, even in its earliest stage. And the court recognized that the state has legitimate interests from the outset of the pregnancy in protecting the life of the fetus that may become a child. So the court struck a balance as it often does when values and goals compete. It held that the state could prohibit abortions after fetal viability, but so long as the ban contained exceptions to safeguard a woman's life or health. It held that even before viability, the state could regulate the abortion procedure in multiple ways. But until the viability line was crossed, a state could not impose a substantial obstacle on a woman's right to elect the procedure as she, not the government, thought proper in light of all the circumstances and complexities of her own life. Now the court discards that balance. And this has happened. The majority says that from the very moment of fertilization, a woman has no rights to speak of. A state can force her to bring a pregnancy to term, even at the steepest personal and familial costs. And this has happened. An abortion restriction is permissible under the lowest level of scrutiny known to the law. States will feel free to enact all manner of restrictions. And this has happened. The Mississippi law at issue here bars abortions after the 15th week of pregnancy. Another state could do so after 10 weeks, or five, or three, or one, or from the moment of fertilization. And this has happened in 13 states. States could pass laws without any exceptions for when the woman is the victim of rape or incest. A woman will have to bear her rapist child, or a young girl her father's no matter if doing so will destroy her life. And this has happened. Some states may compel women to carry to term a fetus with severe physical anomalies. For example, one afflicted with Tay-Sachs disease. Sure to die within a few years of birth. And this has happened. 
States may even argue that a prohibition on abortion need make no provisions for protecting a woman from risk of death or physical harm. And this has happened. Across a vast array of circumstances, a state will be able to impose its moral choice on a woman and coerce her to give birth to a child. And this has happened. Enforcement of all these draconian restrictions will also be left largely to the state's devices. A state can impose criminal penalties on abortion providers, including lengthy prison sentences. And this is happening. Some states will not stop there. A state law might criminalize the woman's conduct too. Incarcerating or fining her for daring to seek an abortion. And this is happening. And as Texas has recently shown, a state can turn neighbor against neighbor, enlisting fellow citizens in an effort to root out anyone who tries to get an abortion or assist others in doing so. And this has happened. The majority tries to hide the geographically expansive effects of its holding. The decision by the majority permits each state to address abortion as it pleases. And that is cold comfort for the poor woman who cannot get the money to fly to a distant state for a procedure. Women lacking financial resources will suffer from the majority's decision. And this has happened. Interstate restrictions will also soon be in the offing. Some states may block women from traveling out of state to obtain abortions, or even from receiving abortion medications from out of state. And this has happened. Some may criminalize efforts, including the provision of information or funding to help women gain access to other states' abortion services. And this is happening. Most threatening of all, there is no language in the majority decision that stops the federal government from prohibiting abortions nationwide. Once again, from the moment of conception and without exceptions for rape or incest. If that happens, the views of an individual state's citizens will not matter. And this has been proposed. The challenge for a woman will not be to finance a trip to New York or California, but to Canada. And this could happen. One result of the majority's decision is certain. The curtailment of women's rights and of their status as free and equal citizens. And this has happened to women and to people. Yesterday, the Constitution guaranteed that a woman confronted with an unplanned pregnancy could, within reasonable limits, make her own decision about whether to bear a child with all of its life-transforming effects. There are a few greater incursions on a body than forcing a woman to complete a pregnancy and give birth. Even an uncomplicated pregnancy imposes substantial strain on the body involving significant physiological change and excruciating pain. That women happily undergo those burdens of their own accord does not lessen how far a state impinges on a woman's body when it compels her to bring a pregnancy to term. In safeguarding reproductive freedom in Roe v. Wade, the Constitution also protected the ability of women to participate equally in this nation's economic and social life. But no longer. But no longer. But no longer. But no longer. As of now, this court holds a state can always force a woman to give birth, prohibiting even the earliest abortions. This has happened. A state can transform what, when freely undertaken, is a wonder into what, when forced, may be a nightmare. This has happened. Some women, especially women of means, 
will find ways around the state's assertion of power. Others, those without money or childcare or the ability to take time off from work, will not be so fortunate. It is not hard to see where the greatest burden will fall. The loss will be disastrous for women without money. Maybe they will try an unsafe method of abortion and come to physical harm or even die. Maybe they will undergo pregnancy and have a child. But it's significant personal and familial cost. People today rely on their ability to control pregnancies when making countless life decisions. Where to live, whether to invest in education, how to approach intimate and family relationships. At the least, now they will incur the cost of losing control of their lives. The Constitution will provide no shield despite its guarantees of liberty and equality for all. The Constitution provides no shield. The Constitution provides no shield. No shield. And no one should be confident that this majority is done with its work. The right Roe and Casey recognized does not stand alone. To the contrary, the court has linked it for decades to other freedoms involving bodily integrity, family relationships, and procreation. Most obviously, the right to terminate a pregnancy arose straight out of the right to use contraception in Griswold v. Connecticut in 1965 and Eisenstadt v. Baird in 1972. In turn, those rights led to rights of same-sex intimacy and marriage in Lawrence v. Texas in 2003 and Obergfeld v. Hodges in 2015. They are all part of the same constitutional fabric protecting autonomous decision-making over our most personal life decisions. Personal life decisions. The majority, or most of it, is eager to tell us that nothing it does casts doubt on precedents that do not concern abortion. Justice Thomas concurred on the majority opinion, but advocates separately for the overturning rulings on birth control and same-sex relationships. But how could the rest of the majority declare otherwise? The lone rationale for the majority is that the right to elect an abortion is not deeply rooted in history. Not until Roe, 50 years ago, they argue, did people think abortion fell within the Constitution's guarantee of liberty. The majority holds that we in the 21st century must read the meaning of liberty as the ratifiers of the 14th Amendment did in 1868. If those people did not understand reproductive rights as part of the guarantee of liberty, then those rights did not exist. The men who ratified the 14th Amendment did not perceive women as equals. But times have changed. The relegation of women to inferior status is no longer consistent with our understanding of the Constitution. The Constitution protects all individuals, male or female, from unjustified state interference. The same thinking about 1868 ratifiers could apply to most of the rights the majority claims it is not tampering with. The majority could write just as long an opinion showing that until the 20th century, there was no support in American law for a constitutional right to obtain contraceptives. So one of two things must be true. Either the majority does not really believe its own reasoning, or if it does, rights that have no history stretching back to the mid 1800s are insecure. Either the mass of the majority's opinion is hypocrisy, or additional constitutional rights are under threat. Hypocrisy. 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 Or additional constitutional rights. Under threat. It is one or the other. It is one or the other. The majority's cavalier approach to overturning this court's precedents is evident. Stare decisis is the Latin phrase for a foundation stone of the rule of law. That things decided should stay decided unless there is a very good reason for change. It is a doctrine of judicial modesty and humility. Those qualities are not evident in the majority's opinion. The majority has no good reason 
for the upheaval in law and society it sets off. No good reason. No good reason. No good reason. Roe and Casey have been the law of the land for decades, shaping women's expectations of their choices when an unplanned pregnancy occurs. Women have relied on the ability of abortion, both in structuring their relationships and in planning their lives. The legal framework Roe and Casey developed to balance the competing interests has proved workable in courts across the country. No recent developments in law or fact have eroded or cast doubt on those precedents. No recent developments. Nothing has changed. Nothing has changed. Indeed. The court in Casey reviewed the same arguments made here in support for overruling Roe, and it found that doing so was not warranted. The court reverses course for one reason, and one reason only. Because the composition of this court has changed. One reason. The court has changed. Stare decisis, this court has often said contributes to the actual and perceived integrity of the judicial process. By ensuring that decisions are founded in the law rather than in the proclivities of individuals. In the majority's decision, the proclivities of individuals rule. The court departs from its obligation to faithfully and impartially apply the law. It eliminates a 50-year-old constitutional right that safeguards women's freedom and equal station. It breaches a core principle to promote constancy in the law. It places in jeopardy other rights, from contraception to same-sex intimacy in marriage. And it undermines the court's legitimacy. With sorrow for this court, and for the many millions of Americans who have now lost a fundamental constitutional protection we dissent. 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 We dissent.